<laughs> Don't mind if I sip away on coffee, do you? No, nah, work away. Uh, yeah. Thanks. Hello, yes, and welcome to Irish Football Fan TV with myself, Gerard Brown, and Paul Tierney, which are here today as we look back on Giovanni Trapattoni's reign in charge of Ireland's five successful years. And one of the main men from that team, Kevin Doyle, is with us today. Kevin, it's great to have you on the channel. Thanks, lads. Yeah, great to be on. Good to talk about something. So, Kevin, it was just actually before Trapattoni uh, took over in 2006 when you made your debut. It was under Steve Staunton. I suppose, obviously, it was a great honour for you to come into the team. You really burst onto the scene after a couple of years in the League of Ireland with Reading into the Premier League. And you got a couple of nice goals during that time, particularly against Slovakia. Yeah, it was. Um, it was, um, I suppose I was like a young deal when I joined the squad. I was very, I remember my memories of it. I've been very nervous. You know, like Sir Robbie Keane, Damien Duff had just won a Premier League with Chelsea. My first actual call-up was Brian Kerr was the manager. So it was in the last couple of games of his reign. And then um, Stan... I came along with Steve Stockton and he gave me his debut Sweden at home and I think it was 3-0. That might have been 3-1, 3, -one, three -nil, but a few of us got our debuts. Um, but, you know, I don't remember much about the game. I, I didn't get involved too much. Probably just happy to get a few touches. I was, you know, still getting, still trying to make a name for myself. Doing well in England at the time, doing very well, I suppose, at Reading at the time. But in an international sense, I would have been um, very nervous. Paul, then it was February 2008 when Giovanni Trapattoni took over. It was a long time, long way for a manager after Steve Staunton was sacked the previous October. What do you remember or your memories when you heard the news that Trapattoni was taking over and a manager with such great knowledge and experience of the game to take over a country like ourselves? Yeah, you know, we'd always get linked with a few big names over the years as, you know, watching as a fan and then as a player, you watch the names get linked with the job and you didn't really believe it when I saw Trapattoni's name. Um, and then you know he's announced and he's coming so for me I think it was just excitement and then a quick on the internet search to see who how many teams has he managed what has he actually won you know <laughs> we wouldn't have done sure any of us wouldn't have been 100% certain we knew he was really successful but wouldn't have been 100% certain more used to seeing uh, his famous clip as um, Bayern Munich manager where he had a bit of a rant so uh, that side of it as well you know we were you know, thinking geez what's he going to be like is it going to be like a dictator here in charge of us and you know, we, we loved joining up with all of us. We loved joining up with Irish squad because it was like a break from your, your club and you met up with all the lads and it was good, good crack to be together. So you're like, is, uh, is it going to be a different atmosphere? All those things going through your head. Is it, is it got, not going to be as enjoyable joining up with Ireland? But, um, you know, from the first minute I met him, he was an absolute gentleman and uh, a pleasure to work with. So that was put to bed straight away once, once, once you got to know him. Paul, what were your memories when Trapattoni took over? As a young fan back then, like myself, we've only been in our teenage years. Sorry to remind you there, Kevin, maybe. Uh, well, I remember asking my dad, actually, who he was, because my dad was always into the Italian football himself. And I remember him just telling me he's managed all the big clubs in Italy. He's managed Bayern Munich, Benfica as well, the Italian national side as well. And I just remember him saying, this, this is a real coup for Ireland here. And it was exciting times, obviously, especially after maybe a disappointing end to Steve Staunton's reign at the time, but it was very exciting, I remember. Yeah, it still was, even though at the back of disappointing campaign, I understand, there still was a feeling this was a really good squad, a lot of players playing the Premier League, there would have been a lot of survivors from the 2002 World Cup squad, but obviously because the Steve Staunton campaign was disappointing, we were third seeds for the qualifying draw for the World Cup in 2010, but I think we got what we were favoured as a reasonable draw time. Italy were coming off the back of a disappointing Euros. Bulgaria hadn't qualified for that tournament, so we didn't really fear them. And the opening fixtures were kind of kind to us. We got Georgia home in the way, Cyprus at home, and Montenegro away. So we avoided kind of the early teams, or the big teams early on. And that gave us a good chance to get a couple of points on the board, Kevin, before we welcomed Bulgaria to Crow Park. Yeah, we did. I suppose when you look at it like that, yeah, we did have a really, you know, when you look at the squad, it was very strong. You said there's a lot of, lads left from 2002 World Cup as well and I'd say the majority of us were playing the Premier League at the time so he inherited a strong squad of bite albeit on a bad run of form um, and yeah I do remember that I remember our first get together and we, we went to Portugal on a camp and all that and getting to know the manager and he was a real gentleman but our first game moving forward our first game to uh, we, that Georgia game was played in Germany um, due to the war uh, in Georgia at the time so again that helped us out, I think. Um, a weird atmosphere, I remember. Um, probably a bit like the games at, at the moment, you know. Um, there wasn't many people there. Um, but it definitely was easier for us than the Georgians. You know, we got to, 
we got to avoid going to um, Tbilisi. Uh, and uh, we got off to a good start. I think we won 2-0 on the day. And personally, I got a goal from him. And it was a nice, comfortable performance from us and, and got, got um, Giovanni on his way. Yeah, I got us off to the perfect start there. Then that came that double header in March 2009, Paul, where we had Bulgaria at home and Italy away. And this was kind of going to be our first test. And overall, it was a, it was a decent return. We got the draw against Bulgaria, despite Kevin or Richard Dunn, sorry, actually put us in front. It was Kevin Gaban who scored the own goal. And then we got that draw in Barry, where we still don't really know who actually scored the goal, Paul. <laughs> yeah, they're both still arguing for it. It was Noel, Noel Hunt and Robbie Keane, wasn't it? Still it was, yeah. Him. Yeah, well, I mean, with Robbie getting the record as well, I'd say he'd be craving that goal all the time. But um, just looking at those two sides that they were playing against, uh, Kevin, did you fancy your chances of winning the group once you started, you know, so well? I mean, like, obviously, as we're, the results against Italy were very positive and we were beating Italy at one stage in Crow Park. Did you fancy your chances? Yeah, yeah, there was no lack of confidence, I think. Um, so it wasn't... Italy were in a bit of transition, I think, at the time, and you know we were once we got off to that good start, and we felt, you know, I think Trapattoni gave you that sort of inner belief. This man's won everything, and he's, um, you know, he's been successful every goal. So he sort of felt uh, deep down, you know, we can. I always felt we we're going to qualify for that World Cup. Obviously, we didn't, but I always felt we we're, you know, going to this World Cup. And I think most lads in that squad probably felt the same. You looked around the dressing room, really good players, and I said, not the toughest group in the world for us. Um, so yeah, we were we played good football that first uh, first campaign under Trapattoni. It wasn't, you know, it wasn't I suppose it wasn't how it ended under him. It was a pretty dour the last six months under Giovanni football wise and all. But that first campaign, I thought we played excellent stuff. And um, yeah, never had I never had any doubt that we weren't going to uh, going to qualify for that World Cup. Obviously, we didn't. So <laughs> it was wrong, but it felt on the pitch. It felt like yeah. we were a good team and we were going to do well. Yeah, it's well documented why we didn't qualify for that World Cup. But I think over the course of two legs, one thing that can't be taken away was how well we competed against France and we were more than a match them. I think the fact as well that we had already drawn with Italy, another European superpower twice, and like I said, led with a couple of minutes ago in Crow Park, gave us the belief that we we're always going to be well able to compete against a French team who probably weren't exactly at the peak of their powers at the time. Yeah, uh, I suppose they weren't. You, but when you look, like, look through their starting eleven. Uh, some good players like Henri was still top of his game and um, you know uh, that annoyed me more than Henri's handball because we played so well especially we, we went to Paris you know we went to their home turf in a massive game and we outplayed and we, we, we should have won the game before ever went to extra time um, you know I was really frustrated about that I think it's as good as that team had ever played before or since that, that sort of group of players we, we were at a peak and we really put on performance that night and it deserved a win in, in normal time. Um, we, we had chances, I had a chance. I remember the first half I should have scored and we had a good few chances during the game where we could have took, uh, got another goal or two. So, you know, I was always frustrated that we didn't, you know, we gave them a chance to get to extra time and, and get away with it. So, um, uh, but you know, it is, it's done, dusted. Um, my best chance to go to work up. So I still, uh, still look back on it every now and again, and, um, a bit of disappointed, but, um, I think the Henri handball thing overshadowed maybe how well we played and, and let us off the hook a bit from, you know, we use that more of an excuse than, than, you know, we could have gone and won the game with, with the way we played. Yeah, like Paul, when I look back on that night, like I kind of look back at it a bit of sweet because obviously the frustration annoyance of what happened with the Henri situation and we missed out. But as Kevin touched on there, it's performance. Like I was just so proud of how Ireland played and the quality that we played. And like people do tend to forget as well that over the course of a 90 minute match, we bet France away from home. Do you kind of carry the same feel yourself, Paul? Yeah, one hundred percent. I still, I actually agree with Kevin. I still think it's the best performance from an Irish team that I've seen. Obviously, there's been a few that are very close uh, in recent years as well. But one hundred percent, they were brilliant, and they should have beaten France in normal time, as Kevin mentioned as well. And it was just sickening the way it ended like that. Obviously, I'm an Arsenal fan myself, Thierry. I'm raising the background there as well, and th Get that was. Yeah, <laughs> that was that was another hard one for me as well because you're going to school and everyone's like, oh, well, you're an Arsenal fan and this is after happening. You'll have to stop supporting them. And all. I know he wasn't playing for them at the time, but look, I mean, it is what it is. It was disappointing, but I mean, the performance was unbelievable. I, I actually just wanted to ask one thing. Um, I heard about, I heard this several times, was that 
the style of play you were going with at the start of the game, some of the players didn't really agree with it, and you just kind of went out in the first half and took the bull by the horns and just went that France, whereas maybe Trapatone wanted just to be a bit more conservative. I'm not sure if that's correct, but... No, I've heard that as well, that we had a meeting, a private meeting and all this. If we did, I was left out of it. Um, <laughs> the lads blank me. No, it wasn't the case. You know, it was... And, and maybe I've lost memory of this happening, lads. I don't know. It's, it's a long time. It's, what is it? How long ago is it? Um, it's 11. Is it 11 years ago this November? Yeah. So, yeah. It was a long time ago, but from my memory, Trap and Tony and we were all on the same page. We had to go there and win. Um, and it was a case of, listen, this is our starting 11. We're a solid bunch. We all know we're jobs, but we have to press a bit higher and work a bit harder and, and you know, throw a little bit more caution to the wind. Um, you know, it's a one-off cup final game for us. So, and, and, and it wasn't, that wasn't a, a behind-the-scenes private meeting type players. Let's ignore Giovanni. I think that was from the staff, from everyone. Um, let's yeah. just go for it. Lose. There's no game after this. This is it. This is our chance. So no point in being cautious. We were behind. We were behind from the Dublin game. Um, so yeah, no, there was no. I've heard it, and I've you know people told me exactly word for word what was said and what happened. Different journalists that spoke, and it's like, well, unfortunately, that from my recollection, that didn't happen. I wasn't there. Maybe like maybe I was just ignored. Maybe I was teacher's pet. That didn't want <laughs> didn't want me to uh, give the game away. But no, nah, it didn't. It didn't happen. But. Just yeah. a couple of moments from us, I thought of one off, go for it. And we had a good group of players who were all playing at decent level and, and we just we just put on a performance that night. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think as well, I think I remember you actually doing an interview with Tony O'Donoghue after the first leg in Crow Park and you said like, well, if we're going to have to progress, we're going, we're going to have to score over there anyway. So I think there was always a feeling that we could yeah. do a job over in Paris anyway. Just like looking back at that time, like that 2010, World Cup, and then like the group that France found themselves in, I know they didn't do that great, but when you consider how well we played in that qualifying campaign in general, I remember as well then the summer games in the RDS that summer, we bet both Paraguay and Algeria, two teams who went to that World Cup. Like there really was a feeling that if we actually went to that World Cup, we definitely would have done a lot better than France and we could have actually come away with another memorable experience. I know, yeah, like yeah, as you said, those summer games, I remember then clearly it was, I was just go with my wedding and I was going on my stag to straight from that Paraguay game, straight to the airport, I think so. <laughs> Memories, uh, maybe I was on a high going away. Uh, <laughs> yeah, but yeah, you're right, like Paraguay, like, they were concentrating for work, they were in camp, they were preparing, like, you know, it wasn't just an end of season friendly for them. For, um, and we were on par better than them, you know, we were so full of confidence. I think we gained such belief at that time and said we were, I suppose, at our peak. Uh, Giovanni was still you know world renowned manager at the time and uh, and, and health wise he was he was still very healthy and um, yeah we just seemed to be it felt right then that you know if we'd have gone to that world who knows we could have been knocked out straight away who knows but it felt like we would have been able to um, give it a right you know hold our own there and put on good performances not just go there and and hope to survive but go there and you know do do reasonably well I suppose yeah like a case of a lot of Irish teams sure look what could have been. We won't dwell too much on that uh, disappointment then. So, um, Paul, then obviously, like, going into your 2012 qualifying campaign, like, it's quite clear to see, like, that there was a good buzz around the team. And Trapatoni had brought back that real buzz. And there was an excitement that we could definitely qualify for your 2012. And we got off to the perfect start with Keith Fahey's goal away in Armenia. I don't know if what your memories are, but I remember coming home from school. The game had already started, and it was been absolutely sweltering heat over there in Armenia. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, me- I remember myself, it was the uh, same as yourself coming home from school and th- when the Euro qualifier games at the time were on, on at mad times on Fridays and Thursday evenings and whatever, it's, it was madness, but a great, a great start to the qualifying campaign for what was actually a very memorable qualifying campaign as well for us. Yeah, then we followed up that game uh, with a home game against our donor and Dora at home and you got a nice goal yourself, Kevin. Um, yeah, Andorra home, yeah, uh, left foot swinger. Um, I scored a couple of good left foot swingers for Ireland actually. Um, that one you made into Slovakia away, and that Andorra, that Andorra one, um, um, oh, my left foot. So, yeah, it was a nice game, nice goal. I think it was just at the start of the new Aviva Stadium era as well, and we, we were on a bit of a high, um, you know, after everything, um. After, you know, I suppose we felt like the one time I was playing for, we always felt the fans were behind you. You always got great support, but felt like 
you know, at that era, the whole country was behind us and believing us, and we had a world class manager. And, you know, it's the first time I had with Ireland that after that, going back to that qualifier, that France game, the playoff, where everyone you bumped into knew about the game, knew everything about it. It felt like they were really on your side. And you'd have different stages in your career, you know, different times. I remember when Stan was in charge, and we were, you know, people were, it was nearly, we were at the end, you know, being made a joke of, basically. And again, at the end of Trapatoni seeing it turned a bit sour. So that was, I suppose, it was nice to be um, to be on a team where everyone it felt like the whole country, not just Irish soccer fans, but everyone was behind you and, and wanting you to do well. And um, uh, yeah, we were on a bit of a roll, started that campaign well. Um, that that game you're on about the way to um, the way to Armenia, it was absolutely disgustingly hot. Right? <laughs> and we were just delighted to get out of there. We didn't. We thought we'd have a you know, didn't think we, we were wanting to win the game. We expected to win the game. But we didn't realize how hard it was going to be. The heat was just horrific, and it was a great result in the end to point out a win there. So, yeah, we were um, we were off to a good start, um, and that whole campaign I think went reasonably well. Um, ended up in another playoffs. Um, but we were always fairly comfortable, and always felt like we were going to qualify for for the Euros. Yeah, but it's only like when we look back afterwards, you don't realize how important it was actually. To beat Armenia home the way, because we thought maybe along with like some Macedonia and Andorra, they were just going to make up the numbers. But they ended up being the dark horse in that group and pulled off some huge results, particularly when they bet Slovakia that really opened up the door for the playoffs for us. Yeah, we and we knew that after that game, we're sitting in the dressing room and we knew, like, you, you know, from the interviews you do afterwards, people are a bit disappointed, you know, that whoever's interviewing you, we should have, you didn't play that well and all. And we we're like, you know what, like, no team is going to come here if they expect experience the conditions we did and have an easy game and it turned out like that in the group um, they were a decent team um, they surprised us a little bit but said it turned out to be a good great result for us and uh, yeah opened the group right up with with them being good because they took points off others first and um, it just seemed to continue from the previous campaign we were on a bit of a roll in good form um, and again had that feeling that no doubt that we'll, we'll qualify yeah, another game that stands out from that group for me, Paul, similar to the Armenia game. It was near the kickoff in the midweek day. Missed the stars for due to getting the bus home from school. Come home to watch the Russia away game. And then all we just see in front of us, literally, because he covered every blade of grass, was Richard Dunn. Yeah, unbelievable. Probably one of the standout performances since I've been supporting football and supporting Ireland as well. Unbelievable. Kevin, what what's your opinions on that? The performance by Richard Dunn? Yeah, it was... Uh class it was early like superhuman he was we were useless by the way as a team that night absolutely how we got out of there with anything from that game was purely because of richard he was blocking everything tackling everything clearing off the line you know it was this like superhero performance stereotypical cut on his head and change jersey and all that sort of stuff um and that, my memory of the game is not getting a touch of the ball we were playing on like this old astroturf pitch really bad pitch a disaster um Everyone was, their bodies were broke up afterwards. It was like rock hard and, you know, it's a bit of an excuse, I suppose, but we just weren't used to playing on, you know, a pitch like that. And uh, But Dunny was just, yeah, man mountain that night. I don't know how we got out of that game with something, actually. It was one of our poorest performances in a long time. From a personal point of view, the same. I don't, I can't remember, you know, looking back on it, I don't remember anything from that game. Regarding me, I don't think I touched the ball. Um I don't think we had a shot in the game, to be honest with you. We were backs to the wall and, and relying on Richard to put in so I, the, probably the best performance I've seen by anyone while I was playing anyway in, a, in an Ireland trip. Yeah, it still turned out to be a massive point. It was one of the crucial points we got towards the end of that campaign, along with beating Armenia at home. that got us that playoff against us, Estonia. The view at the time certainly was this was a dream draw and maybe we got a little bit of... Uh, so it was an upward swing after what happened against France. And it certainly turned into be a dream draw because it was all over after the first leg. We went over there, won 4 0. Johnny Walter scored, Keith Andrews, and a brace from Robbie Keane. And then that just set the game up nicely at the Aviva Stadium because like, it, it was more so a celebration than actually a game of football where fans went to that night. Me? Uh, yeah, whoever, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, it was. It was. It, it didn't seem any doubt or pressure, and I said we got the easy draw. And you're always a bit nervous. Like, this is a playoff. They, they'll be up for this, but it didn't seem like they brought anything to the party. Even in Estonia, the first game, it was over after that, and it was, we came home, and it was it was like a testimonial that in uh, in the Aviva, great atmosphere. And um, I remember being on the pitch afterwards. I think I was injured 
I've come back from injury, but I was on the bench maybe. I can't remember exactly. But I remember being on the pitch celebrating and um, all wearing our going to uh, Euro 2012 t-shirts or whatever it was, doing a lap of honour. And uh, yeah, again, continue on and uh, three or four successful years under Giovanni. And um, yeah, just a nice night, nice no pressure night for us, which is very unusual for us in the playoffs or anything with Ireland to be able to go into that last game and just sort of half enjoy it. And, and um, you know, fans enjoy it and sort of a festival carnival atmosphere in the stadium. Yeah, this was a special moment really for our generation, Paul, and maybe even smaller and younger generations because first major tournament in 10 years. I remember the World Cup in 2002. I remember the Holland game, but I don't actually was remembering when we qualified against Iran. So what was it like for you seeing us finally qualify for a major tournament and living in that massive euphoria at the time? Oh, yeah, it was it was fantastic. I remember myself, I, I couldn't actually get tickets for the game, but I remember my local football club were doing a raffle for the for the players who did play for that club at the time. And half of them were left disappointed because they couldn't get the tickets to go. But uh, yeah, it was unbelievable. Obviously, we were all excited. It was my first experience of a tournament. And when we did eventually get to the summer, my parents were all saying, oh, we'll get the bunting out, we'll get it outside the house, we'll get the flags outside the window. There was just a buzz around the country. And I think everyone was just delighted because it was the first one in 10 years as well. Yeah, we waited a long time after a couple of near misses. Obviously, it was a disappointment in Euro 2012, Kevin. We really were in the group of debt, Croatia, Spain, Italy, three of the top 10 teams of the world at the time. But you touched on it there, the Russia game, like that we played really poor and we were outclassed by a far superior team. I kind of feel like looking back, like that was kind of a, a warning sign for what was kind of coming ahead. Do you think that's kind of a uh, fair enough uh, statement to say? Uh, yeah, I think we were. We went into the Euros confident and, you know, not thinking that. But looking back on it, you're right. We were all a year or two past our peak, maybe. Um you know, a lot of us, a lot of lads were involved in either relegation battles or whatever in England. We had tough seasons and yeah. Um, and, you know, we were so used to like playing France and playing Italy and pulling out these big performances and, you know, doing well against big teams that Croatia, Italy and Spain in our group didn't, you know, didn't overly worry us. We always felt oh, we've got a good performance against these teams. It won't be, it won't be an issue when we get there, we play well. Um, as it turned out, you know, in, in Spain and Italy's case anyway, you know, they both got to the final of the tournament. So it really was a group of debt. Um, Croatia were a really good team as well, but we still didn't, we still, I suppose, went out with a whimper, without a fight. It didn't feel like we were ever in the tournament. The first game, once the first game was over, it was a disaster. And, um, you know, you felt we had to get something from that Croatia game. Played okay, nothing great. Um, but that was a game we felt we had to win. And then once that was over, it was, you know, nearly out of the tournament. And then we played Italy. Italy and Spain were, 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 as it showed, sort of, you know, Spain especially, probably the best, one of the best teams that's ever played, um, played international football right at their peak at the time. And, uh, you know, it was, it was really disappointing because having not gone to the 2010 World Cup, we built this one up so big and this was our chance to do something and felt like it was over. Maybe the tournament lasted eight or nine days for us in the three games. Uh, and we were in and out and gone so quickly after such a build-up, six months nearly talking about it. Um, it was uh, took a while to get over. I don't think we ever recovered from it, that group of players. It was the end of our sort of run as a, as a squad. Um, a lot of us stuck around in the squad for a few years afterwards, or a good few years afterwards, but it was never that core, that team that played for four or five years together. You know, you could nearly name the starting 11 for a long time under Giovanni. There was never much changes. That was the end of that uh, group. And um, yeah, just look back on it. Unfortunately, with disappointment, um, because it was my only major tournament. But um, you know what can you do? You're playing against Italy, Spain, and Croatia, who who were really good. I just felt we didn't, we never laid a glove on them, which was which was disappointing. Yeah, and like sometimes when it goes wrong for a team in a major tournament, everyone starts pointing the finger, saying preparation wasn't great, maybe the wrong players were selected, but. Could you look like? Do you look back and think maybe if we'd done anything a little bit different, or it was just a case ultimately at the end of the day, this was a team that was maybe just a little bit gone past it, probably grateful enough to be there and just in a group full of work, pure yeah. class. I think you summed it up basically. Um, you know, you can always you can nitpick at a million things, right? But if, you know, it, yeah, we weren't we weren't going to we weren't going to beat Spain and Italy, uh, and I, I don't say that. There's not many times. Uh, maybe you know, especially Spain. How many times I go into a game thinking, thinking that very little in my career, thinking if we put a good performance, we can win this game. Spain, it didn't matter how we played, we weren't winning that game. And I hate to say that I'm not like that as a person. I wasn't like that as a player. I always felt we could win a game, but 
they were just so far on a different level at the time um, to us. Um, Spain and, or Croatia and Italy on our day, if we'd have put in good performances and, and things had gone away, we could have got something from those games. And that's that's the annoying thing. Um, but our preparation, mate, nah, couldn't have changed much different. Could have a few different things around the tournament. Yeah, we could have changed a few things. Maybe our hotels, maybe if we weren't in the city centre and stuff like that. But it wasn't, it wasn't going to make that massive a difference, I think, to to alter our, our position in the group. Um, it was our first time in the Euro, in a big championship, I suppose, for a long time, and, and people had, weren't used to used to it, preparing for it in different ways, but Giovanni was, and we were in a camp for a long time, and I don't think anything we would have done would have altered, altered it a whole lot. If it had been that same group of players two years earlier, um, in the same conditions, we would have performed a lot better, I think. I think as well, looking back on the Paul, like a lot of people dismiss your 2012 because of the f- the football and it was disappointment from that side of things. But like you look at it from outside that, it brought brilliant joy to the country. We're in the depths in the middle of a recession at the time. So it gave something for people to look forward to and to be excited about. It was our first major tournament in 10 years. As you mentioned, like Bunt and stuff, there was great buzz and hype around the country. And also for the people that went over there, they had an unbelievable time. And like it really put Ireland on the map as a country that really nice people and like somewhere for people to kind of like look towards as a positive place. Yeah, definitely. I mean, even even thinking of myself, like uh, of myself, like uh, some of my friends wouldn't have really supported Ireland that much. Maybe not as much as me. And getting to the Euros like that brought them into it and made them want to go to home games and made them want to go to see the team playing as much as they possibly could. All these, you know, Liverpool, Man United fans, like who never really would concentrate on Ireland when the international break came around it brought them into it and it brought a lot of people say people who aren't interested in football brought them into it as well and it brought back the buzz that we wanted and i think that helped fuel the next couple of campaigns and got interest back there yeah it did kind of feel from the outside looking in kevin that things were maybe just looking a little bit down with irish football and there wasn't that much optimism going into the 2014 world cup qualifying campaign obviously with germany being the standout team so we always felt we were going to be pushing for a payoff and like the early signs weren't particularly great. Like you had to score late on for us to help beat the Minnows, Kazakhstan 2-1. And then we all remember the Germany game 6-1 when we were really a depleted team. We were missing a lot of players that night. Yeah, it was. You know what? We were we were past the then. Giovanni was trying to change a few things and players. And I suppose the one thing about that whole campaign you could say is a few people got brought in and blooded. A few of the younger players who are still involved now. Um I would say as well, Giovanni probably after Euros, you know, he's a, I, I respect him. He was like a grandfather. I felt to, when you met him, he'd smile and wink at you. And he was just a lovely, lovely man. But I felt he was past his best health wise. I just don't think he had, he was as well as he could have been. Um, his authority, maybe his, his, you know, his, the fear that he had and he would give you and as a player. And um, he just didn't seem to have command that, you know, mainly to health, I think he just didn't have, he didn't seem well to me um, at the time. So um, I felt sorry for him at the time, which was awful um, because he's such a top manager and he was getting a lot of stick at the time. And um, I felt he should have left after the Euros for his own, for his own good and his own health. Um, but he stood around, stayed around and yeah, we didn't play well that campaign. We were in transition of older players sort of finishing up and newer players coming through. And it was a, it was a messy year or two. Um, but that happens, it happens every group of players, every team seems to have, you know, have that transition between squads and teams. And there's always a couple of years where you're bringing the next generation and setting them up for their run at things, which culminated, I suppose, in, in uh, the Euros in 2016 with the next bunch. So positives come down and negatives. Um, that's all you can, you know, that's all I'd say you get from those two years. It wasn't, wasn't too exciting um, football wise not too many great results and it was just a case of getting through it and Giovanni eventually left seeing who, who who was going to come next yeah and like just even looking back more at that campaign Paul like the one moment for me that kind of seemed to kill off any hope was the Austria game at home because we seemed as if we were just starting to turn a corner we bet Poland in a friendly 2-0 in February 2013 we got a really good draw and played really well away against Sweden but that David Alba equaliser like it just kind of felt like it was coming we were kind of inviting pressure on ourselves and after that, literally, just uh, the plug was pulled out of Ireland's life support in that qualifying campaign, Paul. Yeah, definitely. I mean, you even look at Alaba that night. He was playing out of position. He was playing centre midfield that night. And uh, 
he was absolutely unbelievable. The one memory I have from that game was we act, we played quite well, particularly in the first half. But in the second half, there was a fellow sitting behind me in the Aviva and he just kept saying for the whole second half, come on, trap, come on, trap. And as if he was like trying to get him to do something, like obviously trap couldn't hear him. And then he eventually brought on Paul Green and your man went mad. So that kind of sums up that campaign for me. Nothing against Paul Green and Paul Green was a very good player, had a very good career. But it just sums up that campaign that your man was going on, Gene trapped to do something. And I mean, he did do something, wasn't happy with it. So that just sums up the campaign for me. Yeah, just looking back at them five years, Kevin, it was kind of when you had most of your spell in the green shirt for Ireland. What is the one memory that stands out for you on a, on a personal level that really kind of uh, would be your favourite moment? Um, I think it was... Um enjoyed all of it. I enjoyed all my early career, good times and bad. I always liked playing home and meeting up with, uh, you know, friends, I suppose. Um, from a personal, I, I know that France game, to be honest, I think it's as, without scoring a goal, it's as well as I played and as well as anyone has played, uh, the, the 11 that played, that I've been involved with, with Ireland in my career, that's as good as we've played. Um, so while it was a frustrating night, um, a frustrating result and frustrating, you know, how, how it ended up, it's it's also um, I look back on it with you know how we went there under pressure went to Paris and I played you know f- you know on the top uh, international nations um, and did it without mm-hmm. did it in I suppose the right way um, as people say in football uh, we weren't backs to the wall and hoping away from home to get something the game pray that they'd mess up we went out and we tried to win that game and I played them and really took them by surprise um, that was my uh, I was at my peak, I'd say, as a footballer then as well. So, um, you know, I was doing very well in the Premier League at the time and, uh, and going well. So I suppose that's around all that area around then is my fondest sort of few years. Yeah, it's four years going off since you played your last game for Ireland when you retired during the Martin Neal era. Just in that time, for anyone that hasn't maybe known or kept up to date, what have you been doing the last while to keep yourself busy and occupied? I've just come in from, um, from putting two horses into a horse box lads um, <laughs> that's why i was late to the meeting so uh, i i uh, sort of semi i don't know uh semi full-time part-time breed horses in wexford so um it's a, a hobby but also uh something that takes up a lot of time and i really enjoy it so i've been doing that since i've since i've moved home um yeah and it keeps me very busy and you, you probably see me sometimes on rte do a bit um some of the games um on TV, so it keeps me involved, keeps me, keeps my eye in on football, keeps me looking at the games and and um, and uh, yeah, keeping an interest in my young. So I've a, my oldest son is seven; he's just getting involved, and I was helping helping them put the cones out when their session training sessions are on and stuff. So, <laughs> um, still involved in football a little bit, but uh, I'd say probably more involved with the horses at the moment. So it's plenty good to keep you entertained anyway. Paul, just before we uh, wrap up, anything else like you'd like to ask Kevin or, or ask Kevin, sorry, and or even just to thank him for his time? Yeah, just one thing. Do you miss the daily routine of playing football, Kevin? Like say going to train and having a match on the Saturday. Do you miss it? I know this is asked to a lot of players who've retired recently, it, but it change you know what it changes. Some days I miss it, and other days I'm like, thank God, you know, I see teams. <laughs> but, uh, um, it's like any job, I suppose, you know, and, and I, yeah, an early game, say, was, that, uh, the, was it the Denmark game there a while ago on the atmosphere and saying, you know what, I would love to be playing here, I'd love to be just doing the warm up and the buzz you get from it. Um, and then other days I'll wake up in the morning and think, God, I'd hate to be going training today. So, swings <laughs> around about some, some I do, some I like, I like being fit and healthy, and I'm still okay, reasonably fit and healthy, but the fitness and healthy that healthiness that I would have had as a professional footballer was a different level, I suppose, to now. So, um, you miss the friends and the, and the crack in the dressing room and different things, but um, I don't, you know, I don't cry myself to sleep. <laughs> I, like that. Uh, something I did for a long time, and I felt I got the most out of it, so I'm sort of, I suppose, happy enough that way. At least you've got good memories stuck back on from both the club and the international career. But that's where we're going to leave it, looking back on the Giovanni Trapattoni era. I'd like to thank Kevin for his time today and reminding both myself and Paul of some, some great days and some it's probably some of our fondest early memories, certainly of watching Ireland in our, in our youth years. Definitely. You feel old with your talk of being in school for those games. No, oh. it, I'll, say if it's, I'll say it was secondary school to make it help anyway, like if that does help. 
yeah, second year in secondary school for me. <laughs> Oh Lord! Anyway, okay. thanks for that. I enjoyed uh, trying to remember and reminisce. Actually, we've been saying both ourselves someday. I know so. It all comes for It all comes full circle, as they say. But uh, yeah, um, if you haven't already, uh, make sure to give us a follow on Instagram. Uh, you'll find us at Irish. You'll find us at uh, Irish Football Fan TV. You'll find us on Twitter at Irish Fan TV. And if you haven't already, make sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. We will see more great interviews like we have here with Kevin today. But thanks very much for all that watched and keep listening and watching in the future. Thanks.